Hey everyone, welcome to this week's bonus show. I am your host, Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller, Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide, famine in Ukraine, a film the Kremlin does not want you to see. So be sure to watch it, especially to stick it to his agents in MAGA, namely Marjorie Taylor Greene, Mike Johnson, Matt Gates, the whole MAGA cult of Christian nationalists who are the battering ram, bludgeoning what's left of our institutions to try to steamroll us into a dictatorship. But we're not going to allow that to happen. Now are we? And that is why Gaslit Nation exists. And that's why we're all fighting together as a global community of listeners and civic engaged global citizens, because this far-right virus exists everywhere throughout the world. It can happen anywhere. And that's what we're going to be talking about on this episode, like every episode. Now, imagine you enjoy gold. Let's just start there, because we're going to be talking about Iran's attack on Israel and what it learned from Russia in unleashing a swarm of missiles and drones. Yes, an emboldened Iran was informed and modeled its attack on Israel. It's unprecedented, first time ever, massive attack against Israel this past weekend, modeling it on Russia's constant swarms of drones and missiles against Ukraine. Iran's defense agents are entrenched with Russia's. They are very closely aligned. They work very closely together, not just when it comes to Iran, piling Russia full of the drones that needs the Shahid drones to slaughter Ukrainian civilians, but also together propping up besieged dictator, mass running dictator Assad in Syria, where Assad was uh, the target of a popular uprising, the, the Syrian revolution, which he violently clamped down on with the help of Iran and Russia. We're going to get to all that, but I want to just ground us in ultimately what are we talking about here when we talk about this growing, escalating conflict in the Middle East, as well as ramping up his genocide and and trying to seize more and more land in Ukraine while the U.S. has cut off aid to Ukraine. That's what's happening. But let's just ground ourselves in what is the end game here? What does this all mean? Well, if you like gold, if you like mansions, if you like to drive fast cars, if you like to have a team of nannies and butlers raise your children so you don't have to deal with them and buy their way into the best elite schools across Europe and the US, then you're going to want to store away as much money as possible, easy money, and have a reliable source for that dirty cash. Where do you get that? Well, you have to basically embed yourself in a regime of some sort. Well, how does that regime guarantee you job security? The way that regime guarantees you job security in exchange for your loyalty and being a peg in that corruption apparatus is through oppressing the population, keeping it dumbed down, denying it opportunity for growth, and distracting it with all sorts of forever wars and creating all of these external enemies that justify harsher and harsher laws to suppress the population and deprive them of even basic services and medicines, any sort of quality of life rights. Why? Because you want to suppress their talent. If you invest in your own people and allow them to flourish and bloom, and they become smart and innovative, they might take you on and challenge you and replace you and become the new power and so on. So that's why innovation must be killed. That is why universities must be killed, education and so on. And and life must be a prison because that is how you guarantee your immense staggering wealth. I have talked to people who have serviced oligarch, Russian oligarchs based here in New York or have spent time in Moscow teaching English to oligarchs or children, the level of wealth that these children are lavished with, children, where they have teams, teams of nannies and butlers to raise them. And they've everything that they want, closets full of sneakers and toys, helicopter ski trips, and so on the list goes. You just cannot imagine the level of wealth they have. 
So when you look at what happened over this past weekend, it's important to point out that the same dictatorship of stealing from the people to maintain this obscene lifestyle, that's really what is driving Russia's imperialist conquest of Ukraine and the larger region of Europe. Because after Ukraine falls, what's next? Russia has told us clearly what's next. The Baltic states, Poland, maybe even Finland and so on, because they need a war to distract the people and to justify their terrorist tactics against their own people to continue the prison dictatorship. Same with Iran. Iran needs to have its forever war. The dictatorship of Iran needs to have this forever war waged against Israel, where they have this end goal of wiping Israel off the map. Because that's what justifies clamping down on the people that have been increasingly rising up against their brutality, especially when it comes to women and girls. So both those regimes, Iran and Russia, are locked in this existential fight to maintain their dictatorships because they need those forever wars to protect their immense wealth and power. That's what it comes down to. Let's remember that. And so what we saw this past weekend with Iran launching around 300 missiles and drones, the vast majority shot down, a handful of seven or so that made it through, critically injuring a young Muslim girl, a Bedouin. That would not have happened if Russia hasn't been getting away with that on a daily basis against Ukrainian civilians. And I think that's a very important thing that everyone should understand about this escalating crisis right now. People are jaw dropped. They're shocked that Iran went there. They shouldn't be because who have they been working closely with all these years since Russia launched its total war against Ukraine? Who have they been entrenched with these past couple of years? They've been entrenched with Russia. And so they basically took the Russian playbook and now use it on Israel. And no one should be shocked by that because that's what I've been warning about on this show for years. An emboldened Russia will lead to more emboldened dictatorships. And that is what led us here to this terrifying weekend, not just for people across Israel, Muslim and Israeli alike, but for the world. Because the last thing we need is to give Netanyahu his regional war that he wants so he can continue to cling to power desperately, given all the corruption investigations targeting him. And I want to pause there and point out what's obvious. The U.S. led, along with Israel's own air defense systems, of course, the Iron Dome, its air force and so on, but it's really a U.S.-led coalition, which is military bases across the region. The U.K. was, of course, involved. France reportedly played a role as well. Jordan, even Saudi Arabia. It was a big old team effort to shoot down those hundreds of drones and missiles coming from Iran to essentially close the skies across Israel to protect critical infrastructure, civilians, and so on. What's interesting about this attack is that it was launched from Iran, and Iran made clear that this attack was coming, which gave the U.S. and Israel a chance to scramble the coalition to shoot down these missiles. So what Iran was really doing here was sending a message. Yes, it was hoping to slaughter civilians, because that's what it wants. It's a terror regime. But I don't think, I think Iran is also signaling that it too does not want a regional war. And Israel's historic enemies like Egypt and other nations that in Jordan, like that scramble to Israel's defense here, they don't want a regional war. And that's extremely important to point out here because you have pundits in the media, including on Morning Joe, who I kid you not, are praising Jared Kushner for the Abrams Accords for allowing this kumbaya moment of protecting Israel. I want to make clear any pundit you catch in the media Praising Jared Kushner for this moment is telling you that they rely on Jared and Ivanka as off the record sources to get dirt on the far right Christian nationalist political machine driving our democracy off a cliff. Okay, so any pundit that credits Kushner in any way for the defense of Israel that the U.S. led here, they're committing a crime of access journalism. Basically, they want to get invited to Ivanka's next clam bake in Miami. Jared Kushner had nothing to do with this. Once again, his Abrams Accords were basically just normalizing relations that were were inevitably going to be normalized given the way of things and completely neglected the growing crisis of Israel's growing attacks against Palestinians, especially in the West Bank. 
So really, Jared Kushner's Abrams Accords contributed to the ticking time bomb that is now going off with this Israel-Hamas war. So no, Kushner gets absolutely zero credit here. All of the Gulf states that joined the U.S. and the U.K. and France in defending Israel were acting in their own interest. These same countries are trying to push for a permanent ceasefire and to push for a hostage deal. They do not want to have their own status quo power structures disrupted by a regional war, which would put their own standing at risk that could disrupt their own governments and regimes. And they don't want to be flooded with any more refugees. They want stability in the region. They want to maintain a status quo of some sort. So that is why they acted here. Jared Kushner had absolutely nothing to do with it. And it is insane that anybody would even bring his name up in this moment. I'm glad they're doing it because then we get to see who has Jared and Ivanka on speed dial. All right. So I want to point out that people have been pulling their hair out that Iran's attack was in response to Israel attacking an Iranian consulate in Syria. And consulates, embassies are considered obviously sacred ground. It's considered an attack on the country itself. But let's be clear here, as I've been mentioning, as I've been trying to flag on the show for many years now, Israel and Iran have been going at each other in Syria for many years now. And this includes Israel bombing a number of times the airport in Damascus that Iran uses to launch its planes. Also, an Iranian drone making factory in Syria. Israel's attacks against Iranian targets in Syria have been escalating in recent years, especially as their shared partner, Russia, has been preoccupied with its genocide in Ukraine. The consul attack is no big surprise given recent history. And really, the big headline here is that Iran was emboldened to unleash this swarm of missiles and drones because Russia has been doing it so successfully and getting away with it now for a solid like two years now. And so with the U.S. in a stalemate, with U.S. aid to Ukraine on ice blocked and the Ukrainians running out of ammunition, Ukrainian civilians and critical infrastructure increasingly vulnerable every single day to more and more Iranian drones and North Korean missiles making it through Ukraine's own fraying air defense, Iran finally saw the writing on the wall and went for it themselves. That is the big headline of what happened this weekend. Now, you know, with the U.S. saying, we saved you, Israel, we're not going to join in any tit-for-tat retaliation, which is the absolute right thing to do, Netanyahu and his wartime coalition could be smart and strategic, but they won't be. Obviously, we already know that already. And they could also say, we're not going to retaliate either because we just had this kumbaya moment with all of these countries uniting to save us. And that itself is retaliation to show that Israel still has some standing left in the world. That should be the end of it, right? And if they do want to retaliate, the best thing that Israel could do would be to destroy Iran's drone factories, because that would help Israel, certainly. And it would also help Ukraine, because where who, who's supplying Russia right now? Iran. All right. So that is my take on that. And I want to just say what I've been saying since February 2022, amplifying my friends and family across Ukraine, which is the world desperately needs to close the skies across Ukraine. I went on MSNBC in February 2022, and I said repeatedly, I said, there needs to be a no-fly zone. There needs to be a no-fly zone. There have been several moments of history where the U.S. and their allies united in no-fly zones, including protecting the Kurds in Iraq from Saddam Hussein, and nothing escalated from it. No-fly zones are standard. You could say, well, what if one of those NATO jets, for instance, let's say NATO and its allies orchestrate a no-fly zone for Ukraine and one gets shot down by Russia, then we trigger Article 5, then we're in a world war. That is for NATO to decide. They don't need to set that as the red line. They could choose a different red line, like a larger sort of invasion against one of the allied members, like Poland or the Baltics, right? There absolutely could be a no-fly zone right now. That's the second most important takeaway from this horrific story of Iran unleashing a swarm attack against Israel. And it's horrific because however you feel about Israel, because I know a lot of people, including our own listeners out there, are torn on the Israel-Hamas war. 
And obviously, Israel under Netanyahu is carrying out a genocide against Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. No one should cheer what Iran did, first and foremost. Like, violence does not justify violence. Cheering on any sort of escalation is right at home with MAGA and their accelerationism, where people just want the whole world to explode because they think that that's going to give us some sort of reset, like in a video game. That's not how life works. So however you feel about Israel or Netanyahu, what happened this past weekend was terrifying for a long list of reasons. And it also exposed the hypocrisy and the lack of will by the United States when it comes to protecting Ukrainian lives. And it shows how objectified Ukraine has become or has always been. That Kissinger objectification, dehumanization of of treating Ukraine as a buffer zone, as Russia's neighborhood, and any encroachment upon it to save innocent civilians, to save children, a whole generation of children from being traumatized would be encroaching on Russia's property, Russia's neighborhood, when really what a global coalition did for Israel this past weekend could absolutely be done and and should have already be, be done for Ukraine. And if we do not do it, this war will drag out, more lives will be lost, an entire generation will be lost, and the Russians will absolutely go into NATO countries. How do we know that? Because they're telling us that just like they've been telling us for years, they were going to slaughter and occupy Ukraine. So the unthinkable that we saw played out in February, 2022, remember when the whole world was shocked, the unthinkable, the Russians told us they were going to do that. They told us they're going to do that, just like they're telling us that they're going to go into the Baltics and Poland and Finland and so on. Okay, so believe them. Genocide experts like the historian Timothy Snyder have said that the Russians are unique in carrying out their genocide because they tell you, they tell you their motive, they tell you their intent, they tell you they're doing it, which makes proving the case of genocide extraordinarily easy, wrapped up in a bow. So believe them. When people tell you who they are, believe them. That's been the whole lesson of this escalating far right war against us. Okay. So there you have it. Close the sky over Ukraine. No fly zone now. The Biden administration folks who are taking a victory lap over what they did for Israel this past weekend should be ashamed for what they haven't done for Ukraine and all the innocent lives lost. Okay. That is how I feel about it. So those are my takeaways on that. And if you look at Congress now, Mike Johnson, desperate to hold on to his job as Speaker of the House, desperate to please Trump and Putin, tap dancing around aid for Ukraine and dragging that out. There is, you know, the challenge against him by the Insurrection Caucus is growing. And so we're recording this now on Tuesday, April 16. There's chatter on this day that there might be a vote come this Friday for Ukraine aid. If there is, I'll cover it in next week's episode and whatever else transpires over this time of apocalyptic news cycles. I will make a prediction now, which you'll be listening to come this Saturday. I will be shocked if there is any vote for Ukraine aid this week. There absolutely should be. Do you remember when Navalny was killed? Yes, Navalny was killed. He didn't just die in a Siberian prison with torture wounds on his body from natural causes. When Navalny was killed, the whole world cried out. And we all thought that that was it. No, I didn't think, but like (laughs) people, you know, normies out there thought that this was it. Mike Johnson would have no choice now but to pass Ukraine aid. How can you just let Putin get away with killing Navalny? And sure enough, that came and went. And then you had Ukrainian cities going up in smoke throughout March with more and more emboldened attacks by the Russians. And everyone thought, this is finally it. Finally, Mike Johnson is going to be forced to call a vote. And he didn't do it. The guy is playing Lucy's football with us, as I keep saying. And if you want to know why, it's because the Republican Party is bought and paid for by the Kremlin. It is because the Republican Party has been taken over by Christian nationalists, which are the same base that Putin and Orban used to consolidate power to entrench their own rule. And what Mike Johnson ultimately wants is money and power. He's really playing us when it comes to Ukraine aid. So I'll be shocked if this gets passed. And if it does ultimately get passed, it may be a watered down version than what we had passed in the Senate by both parties. And I want to share this clip from President Zelensky's interview, recent interview with PBS NewsHour, 
to share how dire this situation is for Zelensky and his people. And as you're listening to this and the, and the world feels like it's going to hell, keep in mind that right now Ukraine is being led by a Jewish president and a Muslim minister of defense working together side by side for the defense of their people. So just keep that in mind that there are beautiful stories out there of humanity and Ukraine fighting for its very survival with so much working against it is one of those stories. Now here's Zelensky speaking recently with PBS NewsHour. Have you spoken directly to House Speaker Mike Johnson? Two times. I talked to him last year. I was visiting the United States. Specifically, I had a meeting with the Speaker, with the President, with the Congress. Then we had a meeting behind closed doors. They all agreed 100%, those who were at that meeting. They were saying there will be support, believe us, by the end of the year. We had a conversation with the speaker over the phone, and he told me that he fully supports Ukraine receiving the support. He said, yes, of course, he is supported to give, to give defending aid this package yeah. decision of Congress to Ukraine is very, impos- very important, and etc. And what, what is very important, that those period, all, I also spoke with congressmen, yes. a lot of them, many times, and all of them said to me that, yes, Ukraine will get. The question is, in days or some, some weeks, after that, months, months, and, and, and etc. And one important moment, the last one, when I spoke with a team of congressmen, they said, maybe it will be uh, not cheap money. Maybe it will be, I mean, this, I mean, this. Uh, uh? Structured as a loan. Is that right? Yeah, loan, yeah. loans. Yeah, yeah. I and said, you are open to that? I said, it doesn't matter for us for today. We wanted another way to get this money last year. But for today, it doesn't matter. We need to survive and we need to defend our people. And that's why your decision, the ball is on your field. Yes, please just make decision. And it should be noted that Zelensky, a Jewish president, the only Jewish president in the world outside of Israel, begged Israel for their Iron Dome technology to be able to close their own skies. And Israel repeatedly said no and made up all sorts of excuses, including that they didn't want Iron Dome technology to end up in the wrong hands in case the Russians seized it and then shared it with the Iranians. And they claimed that Ukraine was too big of a country, that Iron Dome wouldn't work, and so on and so on. The list went. But you can't overlook the fact that, as myself and many guests on the show have pointed out, that cover Russian transnational crime. Israel has been infiltrated by the Russian transnational mafia. If you look at Abramovich, Deripaska, like Putin's whole court of oligarchs, they have Israeli passports. You have the Jackson Varick Amendment from the 1970s that helped a lot of Soviet Jews get out of the country and go to places like Israel. One member of the U.S. intelligence community told me that Israel got fucked by that because you had the Kremlin sending a bunch of their agents <laughs> abroad, taking advantage of that amendment to try to entrench their influence abroad. A retired developer who made a ton of money helping post-Soviet states build buildings. And he told me that Russia was just a faucet of money, just turn it on and the cash was there for whatever projects they needed. And a lot of the rising oligarchs that he was working with were constantly sending their money to Israel and constantly asking him to invest by paying their foundations in Israel. So the Russians have entrenched themselves within Israel. Russia is the third most spoken language in Israel. A lot of services and things are after Hebrew and, and Arabic, there comes Russia. So a lot of like public services and things, a lot of signposts, are, are, especially in some neighborhoods and areas, are in Russian. Israel is a very Russified country. They very The Russians have entrenched themselves there. There's a reason why Netanyahu, when he campaigns, he puts a giant billboard of himself shaking hands with Putin. That is a problem for Israelis and anybody that supports Israel, okay? And one Russian opposition leader told me that Russia and Israel should be considered as united. It's like as a, it's a very Russian country now. And so likely that plays a factor in why Israel hasn't done more to provide Ukraine with, with a Jewish president with meaningful defensive aid. 
also Russian leaders have warned Israel not to provide ammunition or anything to Ukraine because they're allied when it comes to all sorts of interests. For instance, Russia lets Israel attack Iran, <laughs> running in targets in Syria, you know, looks the other way there. So there you have it. So basically it's Iron Dome for, for me and not for thee. But this double standard of the U.S. going above and beyond to protect Israeli lives. And meanwhile, Ukrainians are terrorized every single day, a generation of children growing up terrorized. This double standard is horrific. And it's important to note that what Ukraine is doing and fending off Russia creatively with what it has to work with, they're doing that for all of us. And we're just sitting on the sidelines as though this is like some, some I don't know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm maddened by all, by all of this. We're just sitting on the sidelines when we could be scrambling our own jets to close the skies and push Russia back and send a very strong message of deterrence. And by doing that, you're not going to get an emboldened Iran raining drones and missiles on Israel. Do you understand? I'm speaking to Jake Sullivan, really. If I sound really fired up, it's because I'm, I'm speaking directly to Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security advisor, who should have been fired by now. He's the one that has twisted himself up like a pretzel, trying to avoid de-escalation. And all he's doing is causing escalation. He's learned nothing from Chamberlain's appeasement during the rise of World War II that allowed Hitler to become more and more emboldened. So that is a big takeaway of what we witnessed this weekend, is that an emboldened Iran learned from an emboldened Russia. And if we don't follow a strict morally imperative policy of deterrence through closing Ukraine's own skies, through a no-fly zone, expect an escalation of World War III. And that means greater instability for all of us, not just those regions impacted. Now, what you're about to hear is a conversation between me and the lovely ladies of the Kremlin Files podcast, Olga Lotman, a Russian mafia expert, and European analyst, Monique Kamara. We are talking all about longtime Kremlin operative Paul Manafort, who is back, reports are saying, in the 2024 election to help Donald Trump. You all remember Paul Manafort. He was the one that was responsible for changing the language, watering down the Republican Party's support for Ukraine at the 2016 Republican National Convention in Ohio. And now that is the law of the land when it comes to the Republican Party establishment that is deliberately cutting off aid to Ukraine right now in the House. And that ideology, that position has just grown stronger and stronger ever since Paul Manafort made that language change in 2016, doing exactly what the Kremlin set him up to do. The fact that he's back, according to reports, in the 2024 election means that he's here to finish the job. And now here's my conversation with the Kremlin File podcast, ladies. And if you want to get access to this full bonus episode, make sure you're subscribed to the show at the truth teller level or higher on patreon.com forward slash gaslit. That's patreon.com forward slash gaslit. Thank you to everyone who supports the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. 